Welcome into an all new episode of Her Playbook. I'm Madeline Burke and I am thrilled to be joined by Good Morning Football host Jamie Erdahl. You can see her on Good Morning Football bright and early Monday through Friday on NFL Network as well as catch her on CBS, on sidelines, out here at the Scouting Combine mm -hmm. in Indianapolis. This girl never stops working. <laughs> How are you? Thank you for taking the time. I'm so good. Thank you for having me on. It's so good to see you. I feel like a real human operating between the hours of 8 a.m. and we're talking midday here. It's right. like, wow, so this is really when things are going because, yeah, GMFB, we roll early. It is very <laughs> early. A 7 a.m. start right there. You guys are up early. You know, this is your second season on yeah. GMFB. I know when you first took that job, you mentioned how this is kind of a different path for your career. It mm -hmm. was kind of a fork in the road because you had been doing sidelines so much so well. You had been doing a lot of that with college, with uh, football and basketball, but doing a studio hosting show was a pivot for you. Mm -hmm. How has that been now that you're two years into that? So ironic that you asked the question that way because we just got done hearing from the prospects at the Combine and there was this one running back in particular who you look at his, st his sheet and he had been like four years at a certain college as a wide receiver and then someone moved him to running back and now he's at the NFL scouting Combine with running back four or whatever on a sweatshirt and it just made me think, like, I wonder who planted that seed to convince him that he had to make a change in order to mm -hmm. get from a position style in order to get to the NFL or get to the scouting combine. And it's very much what I felt in being a sideline reporter or a reporter for CBS was I could have stood on a corner in 57th Street and 11th Avenue in New York City and had a poster that said, I'm a studio host, I'm a studio host for every day of my life. But I think when you begin your career, and I had done it for eight to 10 years between the NFL and the SEC, you know, rightfully so, CBS is like, you're a sideline reporter. This is how this is, this is what it is and what your role is. And I, I just felt in my gut and in my heart that I had to make a change to really flex a muscle, learn a new muscle, the studio hosting muscle, and show CBS, show everybody that like this is something I want to do, that I can do, but you're not going to be able to do it until you put the work in. And so, right. you know, three hours a day, 15 hours a week together, second NFL season on the show, I've learned so much from the guys that I'm with every day, just from the the TV perspective, the business of it. But yeah, I, I felt like I had to make a major change just to kind of say, to, to rebrand myself as a host. Right. Well, and you mentioned three hours a day, 15 hours a week. That's just when you're on air. Yes. That's just the time that you're <laughs> on air. There's a lot of preparation that goes into that show. Yeah. It's a heavy lift. And, you know, when you're talking about NFL football, especially during the season, you've mm -hmm. got Monday night games, Thursday night games, Sunday mm -hmm. night games. Uh, I don't know how early your alarm clock <laughs> goes off, but I'd imagine it's a it's a short turnaround from that. What is your secret to preparation and for a show like that? Um, I do what I like to call a split shift. So um, I have two little kids at home. You know, they really get the bulk of me in the middle of the day, or I try to give them my best self in the middle of the day. But football gets me in the morning, and then it gets me closer, you know, at night. So. Um, it's not your traditional nine to five sports TV never is your traditional nine to five. So you have to be okay with that. Um, but I, I give it up. I give it my all from when I wake up at four 30 until the show's done at 10. And then, um, a little bit of unwind after that, maybe an hour recap of just what we just did and looking ahead to the next day and the next week and the week unfolding. And then at night I really hit it, you know, six to nine at night and just like do the prep for the next day. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful thing about the football season, and you know this just content wise, how much things snowball, right. you know, like you, all of a sudden your recall from things that happened in week two and it's week 11 and you're able to just, it, it really fires off the tongue a lot faster, just like the deeper you get into the season. Absolutely. Now you mentioned how, you know, earlier in your career, CBS looked at you and said, you're a sideline reporter. Mm -hmm. And I don't not see why, because I've seen you <laughs> on the sideline. Thank and you. I got to say, you are so good at that. And Thank I've you. long admired that skill of yours. I've seen you, you know, over the years doing NCAA tournaments, doing college football sidelines. And even now, sometimes during the NFL season, you'll do the international games and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a specific skill, you know, and it's such a hard job. And sometimes people will look at it like, oh, well, what's the sideline reporter got to say? But there's a lot that goes into it. Mm -hmm. You're running around, you're gathering information, you've got to file away a lot of things, you got to have relationships. Mm -hmm. And to do it and do it well is is a feat. How would you describe what that job takes? Okay, so early on in my career, I don't know who it was, I should really think hard, long and hard about this. Someone told me just stop referencing the stats, the numbers. It's not my job. That's not where I should be living in that mm -hmm. realm. Also, when I talk to you, when I talk to a coach or an athlete, 
you rattling off the fact that this guy had 95 catches over 16 games, it's like that you lose someone when you start to say numbers at them. If you right. watch their eyes, um, it has, it's so basic, but it has to be about good storytelling. And that's, people hear that all the time, but the way mm -hmm. I like to explain it is when I would go to dinner with my CBS crew, my first crew in the NFL, I worked with Greg Gumbel and Trent Green. My SEC crew, I worked with Brad Nessler and Gary Danielson. My favorite thing to do is ever go to a crew dinner because I love when Gary or Trent would start telling Greg Gumbel, they start telling these stories. And yeah. you're like, I just like get drunk on the stories. So I'm like, tell <laughs> me more. I want more of this. So I took that into my role on the game. You want to tell this compelling story as if you're sitting at a dinner and you got to tell a story that makes Gary Danielson or Trent Green want to hear it from you and mm -hmm. respond to it appropriately. If you create this nice, well-packaged, scripted, numbers-based, factual report, that's information and that's good, but it's not compelling and people it's not going to stick in people's head. Right. So... My goal specifically when I am sideline reporting is always say something that the guys in the booth have to respond to. Yeah. That they com feel compelled to say, what you? What do you mean? Almost <laughs> make them want to follow up with you. More mm -hmm. airtime, more, more time to tell your story. But it makes me just think quickly back to December. I was in this building for a Colts game and I told a Gardner Minshew story about how he was living in a van in the off season in Naples and he plays pickleball against older ladies and... <laughs> You know, we had a second and eight and a run play, and, and Rich Eisen's talking to Kurt Warner, and Kurt's like, I'm sorry, Rich. I'm still thinking about how Gardner was living in a van in the offseason. It was just so perfect, and it just made me so proud. I was like, I told the story the right way, and that's Absolutely. how I always kind of thought of it. Yeah, if you've got the guys in the booth still thinking yes. about it, you know the viewers are engaged as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such a hard thing, but not just those moments as well, but, you know, you, you've covered a lot of NCAA tournaments. Yep. Those are some emotional finishes yes. some uh like things change so quickly on a dime grabbing somebody after a game like that a win like that and doing an interview in that environment and asking the right questions mm -hmm. and being prepared what goes into that well specifically when it comes to college basketball um, there's so much emotion behind it and the really great memories and the moments I think are teams that you didn't expect to be there you know FDU beating Purdue last year that coach, there's that image of me with my arm, like, gripping that coach. For a brief second, I think people were kind of like, whoa, you know, she got a hold of that coach, like, a lot. He was kind of, like, uh, stumbling on his feet a little bit. Like, yeah. just the entire moment, his watching his players celebrate, realizing what he just did. We He was, he needed someone to hold on to him for a second and yeah. just get us going. <laughs> Grounded a little Secondly, bit. Secondly, you know, in those moments, I think it's not about – your voice it's not about the amount of words you use it's get to the point of what you want to hear and even if it's as simple as I always I love reading people's faces mm -hmm. and even just saying you're crying or you're emotional why it makes them answer the question there has to be a why behind that and yeah. it's a simple observation but you know just getting into if you if you take too long their emotion evaporates mm -hmm. really and so then you can't circle back to the why if you let if you make them go on a technicality of the x's and the o's and you were in that timeout and tell me what happened if your next question is about the emotion the emotion's gone because you made them go on the technicality so i just love keeping it so simple i had an interview once with nick saban at halftime i think of an iron bowl game and alabama was down like 10 nothing or 10 three it was brutal and all I asked him was like, coach, what's the problem? Because I could not come up with, is it an offensive line issue? I, I couldn't. I couldn't say, like, you have negative 10 rushing yards, anything. There were so many problems. So I just yeah. asked him, coach, what's the problem? And he looked at me, and he just went on this beautiful rant. And then that was it. He went on his way, and I was like, great. I mean, you're the expert. Tell yeah. me what the problem is. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, I'm not trying to impress you guys. Yes. Right now, that is so true. And that's such a good approach. Um you know, I know basketball has been one of your favorite sports. You played yeah. basketball in college at St. Yes. Olaf in Minnesota. Yeah. Um, covering the NFL now and covering football. How much has that changed? Is basketball still your favorite sport? Has NFL won you over? Where mm. Where is the heart lie now? It's hard to not have football have won me over just because the sheer amount of hours I put into it now. It's almost like basketball has become my guilty pleasure. Yeah. You know, um, football is work. Football is the business. I love watching the games, but I always know when I watch whether it be games or shows or, you know, content that people are producing. It's like there is a, there is a part of it that it's like part of my work and yeah. it's part of my career. 
basketball, it's like, oh, I just, like, it's on. I hear the sneaker squeaking, and I it's an upset. Oh, this is an unranked team, and they're up five with under four to play. Like, you just, like, I can't help but watch it. And yeah. so um, splitting that dedication when I was at CBS used to be kind of a heartbreak. You know, mid-December, late December would roll around, and football would wrap up, and then you just jump right into basketball, and that was the business. But now it's almost like because the NFL goes so long and then I get to still be a part of March Madness is such a blessing. Um, but I still I, I I love playing basketball still. So mm -hmm. like that that probably still for me. I'm not I'm not trying to get out there and like be in a seven on seven league or anything right. like that. Yeah. I'm not trying to play flag. Like I'll do play I'll play pickup basketball every night. <laughs> do you have do you have a hoop in the driveway? We did put a hoop in the driveway when we moved to New Jersey. We did, yes. Um well, you know, my, my little girls are four and two, so they're not quite, the dribbling is just coming into effect. <laughs> yeah. uh, the hand eye, we're still working on it. But um, yeah, if I any, have anything to say about it, then we'll definitely be, uh, we got to lower the hoop a little bit right now. But we'll you get know, there. I mean, I get that. The four and two year old not yeah. quite coming out right. with that smooth handle. No, 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 no. But you see these kids now with these like right. YouTube videos and everything. I'm like, how did you get your kid to be like that? <laughs> my girls, yeah. So we'll, we'll get there. But my husband played soccer and football. And so he's like trying to get, we're, we're like having a parental pathway issue right now i'm like let's just try to get them to do everything <laughs> all the sports all the sports yes now you grew up in minnesota you yep. went to school in minnesota uh you lived in minnesota when you started your career mm -hmm. moved to new jersey for this job with good yeah. morning football that's a rarity especially in the world of, of journalism and sports journalism broadcast as a whole to be able to you know born and raised and stay in the same place mm -hmm. um how special was that time for you and how hard was that decision to make to leave that behind? Very hard to leave Minnesota behind. Uh, my husband being from there as well. Uh, that being said, w there was, speaking of the crossroads, professionally just reporter host, um, you know, there was, personally, there's a lot of travel that comes along with the freedom to live where you want to live. Mm -hmm. So CBS says, you know, you're on the NFL sideline, you're on the SEC sideline. We don't care where you live, just be able to get to an airport. That's right. all well and good, but you start having kids and the kids want to see you and they don't want you leaving for 17 weekends in a row. And there there came a moment where I was able to have a very real conversation with my husband, who luckily his company's based in New Jersey. I said to him, listen, we, this is going to suck, but like we could rip off a Band-Aid here and leave Minnesota, a place that we love and we loved growing up. But it means that we get to stay together as a family unit a lot more frequently. And it was it was a no brainer at yeah. that point. I mean, flying here to Indy even, I was like, Man, I can't believe I used to do this every weekend with the carry on and the lugging and yeah. the midnight landing and everything. Um, you do it because you don't know any better, but now that I've kind of been off the road and focused so much on the three hours a day, um, and, and the sacrifice that it took to leave home is I, we're, we're both like very okay with it. Yeah. That being said, having grown up in Minnesota and living there, I never really did a lot of Minnesota sports coverage in my career. So I, I was very lucky. My first TV job was out in Boston and then for me to go back to Minnesota, but it was working for CBS. So the, the time I moved back to Minnesota, it was on the road for 49ers games for whatever. So I was able to stay a fan, really, of mm -hmm. Minnesota sports, which I really enjoyed. Would have loved a little bit more cheering when I was <laughs> there. But um, I, I liked being able to, the separation of church and state there a little bit. Which is fair. Yeah, because yeah, it doesn't, you know, muddy the water exactly. a little bit. You don't want to see how the sausage is made all yeah. the time. The occasional Vikings game I really loved. You mm -hmm. know, there'd be a little article in the newspaper about this local girl on the, on the like, I had a London game and the Vikings were in it. Like, that was really awesome. Yeah. But I, I really, I never had to be, like, at training camp in the scrum with the Vikings and, like, having been a kid growing up as a fan. Like, yeah. I, you know, I, I appreciate being able to still just, like, love the team for who they are. Yeah, nice. So you get an occasional hat tip in the Star Tribune. Just, yeah, the, the Star <laughs> Tribune, exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, you talk about, you know, balancing family and travel and all yeah. that. Um, you're expecting your third daughter yes. now. You yep. had a great announcement around Halloween. <laughs> yes. uh, NFL Network on Good Morning Football. They all dress up on Halloween if you mm -hmm. haven't seen it. And you did Rihanna. Yep. Pregnancy announcement and all for both of you, which, you know, yes, well done, well done. Um, but I bring this up to say that, you know, a lot of women, uh, when they're pursuing their dreams professionally, feel like they have to take a choice of like, am I going to pursue my career path? Am I going to pursue my family path? You have done both simultaneously and are doing both simultaneously as we speak. Um, describe, number one, how hard that's been, but number two, how you've been able to ma manage and navigate that. <sighs> 
I don't take no for an answer very easily. I do have Minnesota nice in my personality, um, but that doesn't really make me like amiable to certain situations. I, I put that into to what I've done with my, you know, rearing children and doing the jobs that I've had. I, I just I just try so hard until the universe tells me like it's enough. You can't do mm-hmm. it this way. Um, I think that's what happened with Good Morning Football. I think, sure, I could have kept doing the sideline or pointing. You know, Tracy Wolfson has three kids and she has been on the road her entirety. Um, I know she had her first kids, or her first couple when she was on the SEC, or maybe she had all three when she's on the SEC. And now we still see her doing Super Bowl. She has been traveling, and she raised her kids. And I, I applaud her so much for doing that all through that era. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was just very hard for me to leave them every weekend. And so when this opportunity came up, I was like, I think this is the universe telling me that you've you've kind of hit your wall in terms of how hard this has been on your family dynamic and you're allowed to go this other pathway and pursue something and it it allows family life to be a little bit easier like I mentioned the sacrifice before of leaving Minnesota but it was so well worth it so I just I just try everything Mm -hmm. until I'm until someone or something tells me take a beat so um you know I flew here yesterday I'm 35 weeks pregnant I was like let's we're just going to check the blood pressure. We're going to talk to the doctor. We're good it's to get fine. on the plane, right? Yeah. And then off I went. And if I can get in and out of Indy without having this kid, then we're good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, please. So, yeah. Although there's plenty of medical staff around here. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if there's anywhere that it's going to happen, yeah, this is not right. 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 You guys got something back there? You could check that. What's going on in here? What's up, Howard? <laughs> um, so it. I just I keep going until, until I'm told to stop or do it differently. And yeah. I think that's just kind of always... That's how I crafted my style of sideline reporting. That's how I crafted the relationship that I was in with a person I ended up marrying. That's how I, we decide to parent and live and move and do this life together Yeah, is just keep trying. If you really want it, which I've always really wanted to be able to do it, you are going to be able, you, you, you have to fight for the dynamic that you want to set up in your life. And I feel like I've done that. Right. Right. Absolutely. And you have now your third girl on the way. Yeah. Do you ever think about the example that you're setting for your daughters of like, Hey, you can have it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. I, I try, I try to show them that I say, mom's got to go to work just as frequently as dad has to go to work and mm-hmm. that that's an equal balance. And, and on the flip side of that, you know, dad gets your time just as much as mom gets your time. Mm -hmm. And there was an era, I think, for women in general, not just in sports, where that was not a dynamic that existed, that it really was just so much was on the mom and there was so much sacrifice there. And I really am so lucky to live in a world now where the expectation is balancing out more. Um, And that I found a husband who's just like, you go, you, he's always said that to me, like you do you, whatever, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll always figure it out. I think a couple times he has said, regretted saying that to me because even the good morning football thing, I said, wow, this, you know, Kay Adams is leaving the show and I, I, I might be able to get that job. What do you think? He's like, go for it. You just, and I think after a couple of weeks, he's like, oh God, you might get this job. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, well, I said that. He's like, go for it. But like, like you know, sorry, you're, where you're shooting it? a where half are we court have to shot, move? you know, like I didn't <laughs> think it was a, <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> a driving, right. He might regret that uh, sentiment now, but um, yeah, I, I just want to show them that that you if you just keep a good head about you and a good heart and you treat people kindly and you just work hard and you like what you're doing mm-hmm. that nothing is ever that difficult and yeah. you just like you know it was it I like going to work in the morning and I, I pick them up and they're happy and I'm happy be in you know being around them and just that example the daily like it's okay to do hard things and trust me yeah. doing good morning football is hard being a parent to small people is hard too yes. <laughs> So <laughs> you've got multiple hard jobs that you are, yeah. <laughs> that you are doing right now. Um, when you look back at your career early on and look at where you are right now, what is one thing that you learned o- over the years that you wish you could have known earlier or that mm. you would like to impart on, you know, younger girls and women who might want to follow in your path? Oh, I, I think today, you know, you and I were around – we're still, women are still outnumbered in an event like this at the NFL Combine when it comes to media representation and football. And um, I used to be so scared to walk into a media contingency and ask my question, my mm-hmm. one question, and think about it. And 
overthink about it and then you might stumble on it and then it doesn't come out right and then you regret doing that. Think about all the time you just wasted thinking about what you were supposed to say and how it was supposed to come out. You probably didn't even listen to the answer of the person that you asked the question to. No one else cares. And I, I'm going to make this like a, a guy-girl thing, but like the other guys, the other 50 dudes who are standing around you, they don't care about your question. They care about theirs. So like yeah. just ask your stuff. Get in there. Like elbow in there. They're all standing next to each other. There's no reason why you can't be standing in there. They don't care if you've asked three questions. They've asked six. Like yeah. it, it – don't focus so much on what's coming out. It, it, it's you belong there. You are you are credentialed to be there just as the men that are there. And mm -hmm. no one should ever make you feel like you're taking up their time. That's your job to mm -hmm. be there. And if you want to do it, then go out and do it and feel comfortable being in that environment. Now, it takes practice being in that environment. You know, I think... I remember the first like Minnesota Gophers men's basketball press conference I ever went to and I shaking having to ask Tubby Smith a question and <laughs> my hands are sweating and but I remember that feeling and and now I'm here you know taking up someone else's time from the Dallas morning news or something and and that's okay and you you know it takes practice but I think you just have to have strength and confidence and the fact that you belong in the room. Yeah, it, I mean, it does take some time to learn that it's okay to take yeah. up space a little yes, bit. Yes, yes. But like you said, you know, sometimes people are going to ask questions that, you know, oh, why why they ask? I mean, we heard a guy ask everyone if they believe birds are real today. Yes, so we did. if they can ask that, you can ask your question. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Like, wow, that person has confidence to do that. So exactly. I should ask mine about my le legitimate football question. Exactly, exactly. And room even for if, everyone. you know, there's room <laughs> for everyone at these <laughs> events. We'd love to see it. <laughs> Jamie Erdahl, it has been such a pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. I love watching your coverage of the Giants. Sean O'Hara, uh, you have to put up with him, as do I, so at least <laughs> we have that gem. in common. Sean, Such we love gem. you. <laughs> Shout out to 60 Cent. Uh, it's been another edition of Her Playbook. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.